for those visiting with us online today. Back in the fall of 2022 at Trailhead, we embarked upon a study of the Old Testament book of Genesis. And while we've taken some pauses and breaks from our review of this important biblical book over the past several months, at the beginning of this year, we returned once more to its text and will continue walking through the first book of the Bible on into the spring. And it's at this point in our study this week that we actually arrive upon the longest individual chapter of the book of Genesis, a single historical narrative that covers an entire span of 67 verses. And with your permission today, rather than read all of its passages word for word, in a moment's time, I will attempt to summarize the bulk of its text in order to give you the broader details of a chapter that begins to see the patriarch Abraham withdraw from the Genesis narrative in his old age, as Abraham's eldest son Isaac starts to step out of the shadows into the forefront. Isaac being passed along not just Abraham's riches and livestock and inheritance, but the even more valuable covenantal promises God made to Abraham being passed down to his oldest son also. But before we dive into the text today, let's open up our time of study together in the Word with prayer. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you for these historical accounts that are on record of your activity all throughout creation. And Lord, it's not just that you were there and that you were present, but you were orchestrating a possible path for us to be redeemed, for our fallen man to become rescued from their sin. So Lord, as we continue to study through this biblical book of Genesis today, may we see your activity and know that you are in control that you are sovereign, and that you watch over your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once and for all, once and for all, you offered up your life for one and all, for one and all, the perfect sacrifice. Atoning blood was shed Love conquered when you said It is finished, it is done To the world salvation comes Hallelujah, we're alive And what silence when The veil of the temple was open for man As Jesus went down in the cold of the grave Defeated the darkness when he overcame The keys of the kingdom were placed into hands Of children and priests and of fishers of men Through all generations his voice was Salvation comes, hallelujah, we're alive, it was silenced when you cried, it is finished, it is done, now completed the work of love, hallelujah, he's alive, join the song of the ransom bride.
As we arrive at Genesis chapter 24 this weekend, we learn of Abraham not being at peace. As though God had promised to make Abraham's offspring great, his descendants compared to the number of stars in the sky and as abundant as the grains of sand on the seashore, Abraham's son Isaac, now nearing the age of 40, had yet no children of his own to speak of, not even a wife with which he could produce children, a discrepancy that Abraham sought to resolve immediately. And we could read of this resolution in Genesis chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. Back in Genesis chapter 17, when Abraham questioned both he and his wife Sarah becoming parents in their old age, we learned then that Abraham was ten years Sarah's senior. And when their son Isaac came to be born, Abraham was a spry one hundred years old. And last weekend, in our most recent review of Genesis, we learned of Sarah passing away at the age of 127. And simple math would lead us to then conclude that at the time of Sarah's passing, Abraham was himself 137 years of age and his son Isaac, 37. Yet their son Isaac was still single. And with the recent passing of his wife, Abraham's mortality was unquestionably on his mind. And if it was within his power to do so, and what time he had remaining on the earth, Abraham sought to ensure that his son would soon become married, so his eldest son Isaac could carry on the legacy God had faithfully promised to Abraham. But being advanced in years, Abraham couldn't necessarily do all that he once could in his youth. Don't I know it? And he sensibly relied upon others to manage much of the general operation of his household. One such person being his eldest servant, who effectively takes center stage all throughout the entirety of Genesis chapter 4. But that said, not once is this man mentioned by name in these verses. Abraham calls upon this trusted unnamed servant and asks him to swear an oath. And without getting into too much detail concerning the method of the oath, let's just say that one could equally replace the word thigh that appears here in scriptures with the word loin. Suffice it to say, the swearing of such an oath was a very personal and intimate affair. And taking this solemn oath, Abraham insists that his servant pledge to locate for his son a bride. But this wife for his son Isaac could not come from the land of Canaan in which they now lived but must instead originate from Abraham's homeland, the land of his kindred that he left behind decades earlier. And from here on in for a bit is where I'll ask of your permission to allow me to summarize a large portion of today's text, providing you all with the general details from Genesis chapter 24, details that you're entirely welcome to follow along with me if you have your Bibles nearby you yourself. Well, while taking this binding oath, the servant asks his master Abraham, what should he do if this prospective bride was not willing to follow him back to Canaan? Ought he then to take Isaac back to the land of Abraham's origins to retrieve a wife with him? But Abraham insists that his servant under no circumstances whatsoever take his son back there referring to the earlier pledge of the Lord, who years earlier took Abram out of his father's house, bringing him to the land of Canaan, swearing to give this entire land to his offspring. In Abram's mind, God had led he 
and his family to this promised land. And this land is where Abraham and his family were to forever remain. Abraham insisted to his servant that God would faithfully send an angel before him, preparing the servant's way, enabling him to have success in his search for Isaac's wife. But should this potential bride not be willing to follow the servant back to Canaan, Abraham assured him that the servant would then become freed from this oath. But regardless of the servant's success in the wife-finding endeavor or lack thereof, the servant was absolutely, without question, not permitted to take Isaac back to Abraham's homeland, presumably to keep Isaac situated in this land of promise and not become tempted to leave the area. So agreeing to act on Abraham's behalf in this way, the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore to him a solemn oath concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and set out on a mission, additionally taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master Abraham and well. And then the narrative fast forwards to the servant arriving in Mesopotamia, a journey that probably would have taken a couple of weeks the servant stopping at the city of Nahor, where he aimed to water his camels outside of the city by the community well in the evening, during the time of day when women commonly go to the local well to draw water. Once much of the day's work has been completed and in preparation of the next day to follow. Resting at the well, the servant then prayed to the Lord, asking that the God of his master Abraham grant him success on this day, such success made possible by the Lord showing abundant, steadfast love to his master Abraham. The servant additionally asked God that as he was standing by this spring of water, one where the daughters of the city would come out to draw water, might the Lord ensure that a local young woman respond positively to this servant's request for water himself to drink. And should this woman in turn offer both the servant a drink and volunteer to also water his camels, may she indeed be the one that the Lord had divinely appointed to marry God's servant Isaac. Her doing these two things, affirming to the servant of God's steadfast love for his master. Because you see, offering a stranger a drink of water from a nearby well was was pretty much a common courtesy. But to volunteer to water a stranger's herd of ten camels was a huge endeavor indeed. A typical camel can easily drink as much as 30 gallons of water in but 15 minutes. And at the end of a long journey, these camels would have certainly been thirsty demanding perhaps a couple of hundred gallons of water to drink before all ten were filled, demanding this potential bride make several trips back and forth, lugging heavy vessels of water between the well and the animal's drinking trough voluntarily and without any expected payment or reward whatsoever. And yet before the servant had even finished praying aloud. Rebecca, the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Micah, Micah being the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, or in more simple terms, a young woman who is Isaac's first cousin once removed, came out of the city with her water jar resting on her shoulder. This woman, Rebecca, was very physically attractive, and the narrator additionally informs us that she was a virgin maiden. As any children Rebecca might potentially bear to Isaac, should she become his bride, would assuredly be Isaac's. No trip to Mori Povich for a paternity test needed. And approaching dusk, Abraham went down to the spring and filled her jar with water, after which Abraham's servant hurriedly ran to meet her requesting some water from this young woman to drink. 
Rebecca agreed to the servant's request, respectfully addressing the stranger as Lord or Master. And when she had finished giving him a drink without any prompting whatsoever, she additionally offered to draw water for the servant's, servant's camels also. Not just enough to satiate their thirst even, but this maiden volunteering to water the camels until they had their fill. Rebecca then quickly emptied the water she had earlier collected from her jar into the nearby trough for the animals to drink from and then hurried again to the well to draw further water. Again, enough for all ten of the servant's camels to drink. The servant gazed at Rebecca in utter silence, attempting to discern whether what was happening so soon after his arrival was a definitive answer to his prayer. The Lord sovereignly prospering his journey and providing for Isaac a wife so quickly. The only question remaining, however, was now being whether or not this woman was a part of Abraham's kin, as was required by Abraham. When the camels finished drinking, the servant took a gold nose ring from amongst the riches he had brought with them, and while the passage only names the jewelry here as ring, we learn a number of verses later that it was specifically a nose ring, one of some value, weighing half a shekel. And the servant also gave her a further pair of bracelets for her arms, wearing a combined ten gold shekels in and of themselves. These gifts acting as an expression of his gratitude to this young woman for offering to both he and his camels water to drink. After which the servant then asks of Rebecca to tell him the identity of her father, additionally asking if there might possibly be room in her father's house for both he and his camels to spend the evening. While the narrator already made the reader aware of her parentage, Rebecca now personally shares with Abraham's servant her identity, without even sharing her own name, as she offers the names of her father, grandmother, and grandfather, making the servant aware that she was from the precise lineage that Abraham was seeking, from which to discover for his son a wife with Rebecca also adding that they had plenty of both straw and fodder for the camels at her home, along with room for the servant and those who were traveling with him to spend the night too. The servant bowed his head and worshipped the Lord, offering blessings to the God of his master Abraham, praising him for not forsaking his steadfast love and faithfulness towards his master. The servant also rejoicing that God had also faithfully led him directly to the house of Abraham's kinsmen as well. Albeit as a daughter of the household, Rebecca didn't have the personal authority to invite a strange man and his traveling party into her home. So she ran quickly back to her house to make everyone else aware of what had just transpired. Not much is said in this chapter about Rebecca's father. And some biblical scholars have concluded that maybe he was too physically weak or maybe incapacitated as, causing Rebecca's brother Laban instead, Abraham's great nephew, to primarily speak on behalf of the family. But upon hearing of the man Rebecca had encountered, learning of the not one, not two, but ten camels the man had been traveling with, camels at that time being a rarity due to the expenses involved in both purchasing and maintaining the ownership of even one, and at the same time, seeing the, the valuable nose ring and expensive bracelets the man had gifted to her, Laban ran out post haste to meet this gentleman for himself, finding Abraham's servant still waiting with his camels at the spring. Addressing Abraham's servant as blessed of the Lord, concluding that a person couldn't possess such wealth without the Lord's blessing, Laban invited the servant to come to his house where he'd already prepared a place for the servant and his company and even these many camels. So Abraham's servant went to the home where his camels could feed and he also found there water available to wash his feet and the feet of those who were with him too. Water that may have just been collected 
by Rebecca at the well a little while earlier. And once his camels had been tended to, and his feet suitably washed, a grand spread of food was set before Abraham's servant to eat. But even after the end of his long journey, the servant, who was most probably hungry, refused to eat until he had opportunity to speak, underlying the importance of the mission he had been sent on by his master. And what follows in today's passage is a rather in-depth accounting of all of what I just summarized for you earlier from Genesis chapter 24, with Abraham's servant now himself sharing of how his master had been greatly blessed by the Lord. And seeking a bride for his son, he sent the servant back to his master's homeland to find a bride suitable for his son Isaac. The servant shared how when he arrived in the area, he asked God to assist him in discerning the woman Lord would provide for Isaac and of his plan to see if any of the young maidens would volunteer to water his camels. And before he could even finish praying to God on the subject, Rebecca arrived at the well and acted in precisely the way that the servant had hoped for, leading the servant to asking those listening to his story, now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel, Rebekah's father, answered and said, The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. Both the servant's question and the manner in which it was answered were probably more commonly understood back in the day in which this text was originally written, much more easily than it is today in the present, really. You see, when Abraham's servant asked, Now then, if you're going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. What he is basically asking for is an answer regarding whether or not Rebecca's family likewise believes that God has appointed the sister and daughter to be Isaac's bride. And he's inquiring whether they will show ample love and faithfulness to his master Abraham by granting their approval of Rebecca's union with Isaac. But if they don't approve, the servant is asking that they let him know now so that he can avoid wasting any further time here and immediately make plans to go elsewhere, turning either to the right hand or to the left, as opposed to staying on this present course. And when Laban and Bethuel respond to the servant's question by answering, The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. What they are effectively saying is God has already spoken on the matter. And there's nothing more that can be humanly said or added. As though to say God has already provided both you and us with a definitive answer. And who are we to oppose the Lord's decision in this matter? He has spoken. And hearing that Rebecca's household approved of this family arranged union, Abraham's servant bowed to the earth before the Lord in recognition of God's provision, before offering to Rebekah and the family a wealth of riches from amongst the presumed wedding dowry he had brought with him from Canaan. In the following morning, after they had all eaten and slept, Abraham's servant was anxious to head home and deliver the good news to his master, the prize bride Rebekah herself, traveling with him. But Rebecca's family pleaded with Abraham's servant to let Rebecca stay a little bit longer before leaving them. With the servant hesitant to comply, questioning that if God had already spoken, were they now attempting to cause him delay? So the family opted to let Rebecca herself decide, with her answering famously, I will go after which her family offered to her a blessing, one in which they expressed a desire for her offspring to be both plentiful 
and victorious over their enemies. Decades earlier, God had made a covenant with Abraham, promising that if he faithfully followed the Lord, leaving the comforts of home and family behind to travel to a land of foreigners, the Lord promised to faithfully provide. And here, in today's passage of Scripture, Rebecca equally expressed a personal willingness to herself leave the comforts of her home and family behind. Not just traveling to a land of foreigners, but also marrying a complete and utter stranger who dwelled there. And we can conclude that she was willing to do so because if she too followed the Lord in obedience, she would become blessed as well. So away she went, Rebecca with her own personal nursemaid, Abraham's servant, and all of the men that traveled with him, everyone climbing back aboard their collection of camels returning back to Canaan. In Genesis chapter 25, we learn that three years had passed between Sarah's passing and Rebecca's arrival with scriptures additionally informing us that while Isaac may have been living elsewhere in Canaan at the time of his mother's death, he had since returned back home. And as he was out meditating in a field towards evening, he witnessed the approach of the servant's caravan. In Genesis 24, verse 63, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field towards evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought Rebekah into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. All throughout the length of Genesis chapter 24, the servant regularly referenced his master, Abraham. Yet on this occasion, he refers to the man in the field as his master. For as Abraham's heir, the servant earlier sharing in Mesopotamia, that Isaac had been personally given all that his father had, this man, now in the field, Isaac, was indeed the servant's master. Rebecca then covered her face with a veil, as was proper decorum for a betrothed woman to be veiled in the presence of her fiancé prior to their union. And after personally learning from his father's servant of all that had transpired, Isaac took Rebekah into the still standing, empty, unoccupied tent of his mother and consummated their marriage. Rebekah now becoming the clan's new matriarch. And with that, we arrive at the end of Genesis chapter 24. The persons of Abraham and Sarah becoming succeeded by the pairing of Isaac and Rebekah. And in summation of this particular passage of Scripture, Gordon Wenham, biblical scholar, writes, Abraham's servant is a man who prays before he acts, praises when his prayers are answered, and lives ever conscious that the affairs of men are controlled by the hand of God. And shouldn't that be a pattern for living that we might all aspire to ourselves? Praying before we act? Praising God after our prayers have been answered? And living our lives with a complete and trusting awareness that God is in control. In control over all things. And we get into great difficulty when we try to wrest such control out of God's hands, or we demand that God act in our own timing instead of us waiting on His. As a servant in Abraham's household, 
This man would have himself been submitted to circumcision, much like his master. Likewise, sharing his master's faith in the Lord as well. And oftentimes when the servant pleads with the God of his master, Abraham, he does so because he's acting here on behalf of his master, Abraham. But that doesn't mean that he didn't possess a personal faith of his own. After Rebecca's parentage had been made known to him, affirming for him that he had successfully found a proper bride for Isaac, Abraham's servant praised God, not just on behalf of Abraham, but praising God personally, himself, thankful that the Lord had granted unto him swift success in this mission. In verse 26, the man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness towards my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen, which demanded that the servant worship God as well. And as we conclude today, might we also ask of ourselves, What do we have to be thankful to the Lord for? And do we personally praise God in light of his provision or just accept it without showing to him any gratitude at all? Abraham trusted in the Lord as evidenced by his actions, departing from the home of his father to follow the Lord in faithfulness. And though it was an arranged marriage, as was customary of the day. Neither Isaac nor Rebekah involved in any manner of courtship. When it came time to depart for Canaan, Rebekah expressed her willingness to go. And I would like to think that she wasn't persuaded to do so, enamored by a collection of camels or swayed by the potential promise of riches and treasure, but rather her decision being based upon a firm belief that God was involved and he was completely orchestrating this impending nuptial. With Rebecca, like Abraham before her, leaving the comfort of family and home behind to faithfully follow the Lord in obedience. And before we conclude today, may I ask of you this weekend, do you feel as though God is calling you to follow him in obedience? And are you prepared to go wherever God is calling you? Be it to turn away from a selfish habit that takes glory away from God? or Might you rather reject the path God has designed for your own life with you choosing instead to turn either to the right or to the left? Has God made known to you the path for your life? And there's no reason to speak neither bad nor good? As we aim to regularly seek the Lord in prayer, may we actively ask for him to make clear of what he is calling us to. And when he does, might there be anything that is possibly causing us to hesitate? Anything from preventing us declaring, as Rebecca historically did, I will go. a treasure we possess in Jesus Christ our Lord. His blood our ransom and defense, His glory our reward. The sum of all created things is worthless in compare. For our inheritance is Him whose praise angels declare. And how free and costly was the love displayed upon the cross. While we were 
undead and untold sin, the sovereign purchased us. The will of God the Father demonstrated through the Son. The Spirit seals the greatest work, the work which Christ has done. Would you join with me as we close our time together in prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. And while it is one that is familiar to many, Lord, may it have touched our hearts in a much deeper way today. Lord, while you were in control and orchestrating all of these events and affirming for ser the servant that Rebecca was the bride of your choosing, Lord, it also required that Rebecca herself accept this fact, that Rebecca herself be willing to go where you were calling her. And Lord, your calling is not outdating, but Lord, that you continue to call your people into righteousness. You continue to call to your people to follow you rather than follow our own sinful, selfish desires. So Lord, when you speak, may we listen. And when we hear, may we obey. Lord, may you challenge us this week that when we hear your voice and when the small voice in our hearts, in our spirits speaks out to us, may we not turn a deaf ear to it, but may we listen and obey, desiring with all of our heart to follow you in faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we return again together next week, well, the history will fast forward a few years to the time of, a of Isaac and Rebecca's children being born, a pair of twins, twins named Jacob and Esau. Until next time, may God bless you all and have a great week. Bye for now.